nitrogen is one of the most important elements for life on Earth. It's a key component of proteins, where it forms strong peptide bonds that link together amino acids into a long, stable chain. Many amino acids, such as arginine, contain additional nitrogen in positively charged functional groups that help the polypeptide chain to fold up into complex and diverse 3D structures. Nitrogen is also a key component of DNA. The aromatic rings, commonly referred to as nitrogenous bases, are held together by electrostatic hydrogen bonds. This allows DNA to assemble into a double helix and acts as a template for its own replication. Nitrogen is the most abundant element in the Earth's atmosphere, comprising 78% of all gases. Unfortunately, the bond between the atoms in N2 gas is ridiculously strong and it's not biologically available to us. The next most common gas is oxygen, which makes up 21% of the atmosphere. Like nitrogen, oxygen also exists as O2, but the bond isn't as strong. It also has a weird electron configuration that makes it incredibly reactive, allowing us to breathe it in and use it as an electron acceptor during aerobic respiration. The remaining 1% is mostly water vapour, greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide, and a tiny amount of Nobel gas like helium. What makes nitrogen so stable and unreactive? The strength of a chemical bond is measured by the amount of energy it takes in kilojoules per mole to separate the atoms. Most common bonds, such as CH, require around 300-400 kilojoules per mole to break, since they only share one pair of electrons. Double bonds, such as CO and carbon dioxide, require far more energy to break. Carbon dioxide is a special case due to the greediness of oxygen in chemical bonds. Oxygen has far higher affinity for electrons than carbon, so it pulls most of the electron density towards itself. This leaves the carbon with a slightly positive charge, and this charge in the quality makes CO2 more reactive to enzymes, allowing plants to use it for photosynthesis. N2 nitrogen is a triple bonded molecule. It has one of the highest bond energies known, and there is no charge in the quality for enzymes to exploit. This makes breaking the bond a Herculean task. Eukaryotic organisms, such as plants and animals, are incapable of using it directly as a nitrogen source. In the context of everyday life, you've probably heard of nitrogen as an essential fertiliser. Nitrogen is key for crop growth, but it must be supplied in the appropriate bioavailable form, ammonia. During the First World War, this was a massive problem. There was not enough fertiliser to go around, and the people of Germany are running out of food. A chemist named Fritz Haber developed a method to split the N2 triple bond and turn nitrogen in the air into ammonia fertiliser. This process used an iron catalyst to provide a more stable transition state for the reaction to proceed along. The flaw in this reaction was that it was in equilibrium, and the catalyst could allow the reaction to happen backwards. The position of equilibrium was controlled by doing the reaction under immense heat and atmospheric pressure. For living organisms, this simple reaction would be impossible. A temperature this high would cause the cell to burn up and explode. So how do they do it? Nitrogenase is a bacterial enzyme that uses ATP energy to break the triple bond in a sneaky way. The Haber process supplies hydrogen directly, but nitrogenase delivers the two ingredients of hydrogen a proton nucleus and its single electron separately. This enzyme isn't perfect and sometimes accidentally sticks two hydrogens together before nitrogen even gets there, and this creates a little bit of H2 gas as a byproduct. The energy required to break the N2 triple bond is supplied in the form of ATP hydrolysis. The breaking of a bond of ATP is incredibly exothermic, and this energy is harnessed to twist the shape of the protein, allowing it to move electrons into nitrogen. The key catalyst in this enzyme is also made of iron, plus another special metal called molybdenum. To put this into perspective, the Haber process is like a good old fashioned piece of cake that provides hydrogen in a nice neat package. Nitrogenase, however, is like a fancy, pretentious, deconstructed cake that gives you everything in pieces, protons and electrons. Let's take a look at how the reaction happens. Nitrogenase exists as a twin, with two identical enzymes stuck together top to tail. It has three different protein subunits that work together. The green one harbors ATP and it contains a magnesium ion which catalyzes the exothermic hydrolysis reaction. The blue and pink subunits hold onto clusters of iron and sulfur that serve as stepping stones for the electrons to jump across. The six electrons required for this reaction are supplied by a carrier protein such as ferrodoxin and they are fed in through the uppermost cluster. 
The P cluster in the middle is especially interesting because its structure changes in between electron transfers. It acts like a valve to prevent electrons from flowing backwards. The FEMO cofactor at the bottom is where the action happens. The molybdenum ion binds to nitrogen, pulling electron density towards one side of the N2 molecule. This leaves the other nitrogen atom deficient and more reactive to electrons forced into it by the enzyme. You may have noticed a pretty big problem. Oxygen is practically the exact same size and shape as nitrogen, and far more reactive. So what stops nitrogenase from just reacting with oxygen instead? Well, nothing does. If oxygen is around, it reacts so strongly with the metals of nitrogenase, that it basically rusts it and permanently breaks the enzyme. Consequently, nitrogen-fixing bacteria are anaerobic, living in places without any oxygen around. And they've evolved some pretty cool mechanisms to keep oxygen out. For example, many azobacteria live in symbiotic relationships with legume plants like peas. The legumes keep nitrogen-fixing bacteria inside protective, oxygen-free nodules in their roots. The bacteria are underground, so they're not able to make their own sugar through photosynthesis. This is provided by the plant. In return, the bacteria produce lots of spare nitrogen for the plant to use. After the legume plant's life is over, lots of extra-organic nitrogen has been released into the soil. And this is why legume plants are used frequently in crop rotations to restore more nitrogen fertilizer to the fields after the crop's gone. One last cool fact. Legume plants secrete a protein into the nodules called leghemoglobin that binds strongly to any oxygen that may have slipped through the cracks and stops it from getting to nitrogenase. This protein is an evolutionary relative of hemoglobin and myoglobin proteins that us humans use to carry oxygen to active firing cells. Thank you for watching.